Harry Potter was, and continues to be, a phenomenon. It turned its author from an unemployed dreamer writing the first draft of what would become the Philosopher's Stone in a local cafe, to a billionaire who built a media empire out of her creation. Everywhere you go nowadays, Harry Potter seeps its way in, from Primark selling Gryffindor tat, to people on Tinder asking you what fucking Hogwarts house you'd be in, which considering that I wasn't unusually brave, smart or evil as an 11 year old would probably have had to have been Hufflepuff, to Lord Voldemort being the new yardstick against which to measure real life politicians. Smart people are often referred to as a Hermione, and even now, after years, the Leavesden Studios Harry Potter studio attraction showing off various props and sets that were used in the movies is still going strong, and I know people my age who have been four or more times just to see the model at the end under different seasons. For almost everyone under the age of 35, there is no more well known and beloved piece of media than Harry Potter. And that's fine, I guess, people can like what they want, but, well, is that not a rather troubling indictment of millennials' political evolution? If you've been following me for a while, you're almost certainly aware that I, like most left-leaning people my age, have a difficult relationship with the Harry Potter franchise, partly stemming from J.K. Rowling and her centrist, turfy, Blairite, dogshit personal politics, and her slow drift rightwards in recent years. This is a woman who was reduced to writing large parts of the Philosopher's Stone on napkins due to poverty, and yet not only actively opposes politicians attempting to end, or at least reduce, poverty, but also does very little with her enormous wealth to help people in need, now that she's on the other side of that wealth gap. And no, before you say anything, don't fucking bring up charity. Giving an infinitesimal percentage of your overall wealth to charity when you are that rich is a worthless, empty gesture. She is a billionaire. She could give away 99% of her wealth and still be richer than any of us will ever be if we live to be a hundred. And don't get me wrong, I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but I mostly want to focus on the actual content of the books, terrible play and cringeworthy Fantastic Beasts movies, because the JK Rowling is bad takes are everywhere now, and whilst I'm more than happy to make a few jabs at her shitty politics, I don't want the whole video to be about that. Like I said, there's a ton of fuck JK Rowling videos out there already, look one of those up or something, but even without going too much into Rowling's frankly pretty messed up worldview, it's pretty clear that the world she created, which was, to be fair, formed and influenced by said philosophy is also pretty messed up, which goes completely unacknowledged by the characters or the story, because centrism doesn't allow for self-reflection or criticism of systemic and or societal problems, and Rowling wasn't about to write a story about a young hero who overthrows a flawed and unjust system in order to install a fairer, more egalitarian one now, was she? No. As a Blairite, she has to necessarily see problems and evils like racism or corruption as caused by individuals, not by the system working as intended. Of course, I want to show you why I think this is, and to demonstrate that only a true monster could ever see the world of Harry Potter as a pleasant one after even a few seconds of thought, so that's why this video exists. You may disagree with me, and if so, please leave a comment and I'm more than happy to discuss it with you. Also, I suppose I should apologise in advance to any Harry Potter fans in the audience because you will probably not like this video, or if you do, you may not be able to see your favourite books the same way again. So without further ado, let's begin with the institution probably most well known amongst the fandom and society at large, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. You're a wizard. When discussing how radical politics and an extreme status quo is enforced and drilled into a population over the long term, the first port of call, after propaganda and rhetoric, which we'll get into in a moment, is the education system, and the magical world, as described in Harry Potter, is no different. We'll go into the reasons why I think this is in a moment, but in my opinion, the education system of Harry Potter is really quite extreme, and were it real, we would be in dire need of a serious overhaul. <laughs> Okay, so first off, we have to discuss the point system and the four houses, which incidentally is apparently a thing in all wizarding schools kind of weird how it's four and not seven, considering that seven is apparently a number with a huge amount of magical and cultural significance, but you know, whatever. Four is a more manageable number for kids to be able to conceptualise, and after about five you're gonna run out of solid ideas for houses that aren't copied from other countries and end up with, I don't know. No, it's not the number of houses that concerns me here, but the fact that they exist at all, and specifically how they're categorised. But first, let's talk about competition. In Western societies, it's a common truism that competition is natural natural, healthy, and important for young people, but especially young men, to have drilled into them from an early age. However, the thing about truisms is that a lot of the time they're not, you know, 
true at all. In fact, as child psychology expert and researcher Alfie Cohen discovered, instilling such competitive ideals can actually be extremely damaging to a child's self-esteem and academic performance, and in some cases can even lead to anxiety and withdrawal. The evidence overwhelmingly suggests that competition is destructive, particularly, but not exclusively, for children. It's a toxic way to raise children. The absence of competition seems to be a prerequisite for excellence in most endeavours, contrary to received wisdom. In fact, to be perfectly brutally honest here, the reason we in the West value competition is because we live under an economic system that requires it in order to function. Humans as a species are naturally cooperative and collaborative, not competitive. As we see in our closest animal neighbours, apes, they are mostly community focused, and likewise many historians and archaeologists do agree that pre-civilization we as a species were more collaborative than competitive, because we needed to be in order to survive. Competitiveness is unnatural. I've mentioned this before, but economies and societies based on cooperation rather than competition, for example worker co-ops, actually perform significantly better on average. Now, I'm not going to try and extrapolate that out to the world of Harry Potter because the economy is all kinds of fucked up and I've got a whole section on it later, but suffice to say that as far as we can tell, the economy is at least vaguely capitalist in nature. So in essence, by putting students into these four groups and then basing almost every action they take in their school lives around gaining or losing house points, they create a system wherein this competitiveness is baked into so many facets of the school experience that it's impossible to escape, and is of course socially enforced. At several points during the books we see students chat chastising or shaming one another for losing house points, and at no point does anyone actually stop and think, hey, this is bullshit, fuck the house cup. Let's talk about group bias. The house system, as I alluded to earlier, is pretty fucked up. Not only does it encourage extreme levels of unhealthy rivalry and aggression when it comes to the house cup, the Quidditch cup and so on, but by definition it also encourages extreme group bias. The houses all take classes together, eat together, socialise in their own common rooms and often don't even know where the other common rooms are, and so on, but often people who do know one another beforehand actually get separated. We see this with the Patil twins, who are not only family, but identical twins, and judging by the Hogwarts we see through the books, likely don't get to see one another all that much, and potentially have their relationships slowly dwindle due to this arbitrary separation. This of course is exacerbated by the fact that Hogwarts is a boarding school, and as a result often family ties and relationships can also be heavily affected by this. Imagine if between the ages of 11 and 17, you are only able to see your family for maybe like two months a year? In fact, you don't even have to imagine it to see how bad it is, there have been a ton of studies, as well as testimonials from former boarding school students detailing the lasting psychological damage such environments inflict upon children. We don't get to see this much because most of the characters in the story appear unaffected by it on the surface, and of course the story is told from the perspective of Harry, whose home life was mostly characterised by abuse and neglect, so for him it's not really a huge concern, and if anything, it's an improvement. I don't know, the whole boarding school thing seems like kind of a waste of time, like they literally have multiple methods of teleportation in this world, just send some of the kids home by porky at weekends or something, you know? There's actually a psychological condition known as boarding school syndrome, common among former boarding school kids, which can cause depression, anxiety, substance abuse, obsessive controlling behaviour, and an inability to build functional interpersonal relationships, which, to be honest, explains most of the Tories right now. Early rupture with home has a lasting influence on attachment patterns. When a child is brought up at home, the family adapts to accommodate it. Growing up involves a constant negotiation between parents and children, but an institution cannot rebuild itself around one child. Instead, the child must adapt to the system. Combined with the sudden and repeated loss of parents, siblings, pets and toys, this causes the child to shut itself off from the need for intimacy. This can cause major problems in adulthood, depression, an ability to talk about or understand emotions, the urge to escape from or destroy intimate relationships. Your environment shapes your upbringing. I feel like this is common knowledge at this point, but apparently no one seems to have thought much about how arbitrarily splitting children into four barely defined characteristics at age 11 and then structuring their entire adolescence around those characteristics, theming their social areas around those characteristics, and surrounding them with other people deemed to be possessors of said characteristics, well, it's a self-perpetuating system, right? Like, put a quarter of all children in a fucking dungeon, say that that's the house for evil kids, point out that every dark wizard was one of them, give them an abusive wank stain as a head of house, and surround them with older kids who have already been successfully indoctrinated into the core house values for a few years, and you're basically fucking asking for trouble. Likewise, round up all the smart kids, tell them they're smart, and give 
get them in the same classes together, and they're probably going to value education more than the kids who are apparently brave, which, I mean, what does bravery even look like at age 11? Just seems weird to me that it's apparently common knowledge that everyone who turned out to be evil was in Slytherin, and no one stopped to think, hey, wait, maybe there's some connection here that we need to address before immediately jumping to the conclusion that those people were just already evil at age 11. The whole idea seems incredibly flawed, inherently damaging, and a little bit like brainwashing, to be honest. Why not just split them up randomly and give them identical common rooms? Why even have houses at all? Most schools don't have houses, it's kind of just a weird posh thing that places like Eaton do, encouraging some inter-house cooperation as well, you know? I get that they're occasionally able to chat to people in other houses if they see them around, and they do share some classes with other houses, but really, come on now, if you spend every waking hour with people you're told are the same as you just because they share an arbitrary characteristic with you, well, it's going to be much easier to make friends with those people, right? I really don't think it would be a huge stretch to make the assertion that a lot of the problems facing the wizarding world can be traced back to this philosophy of categorization and separation that young witches and wizards have to endure during their formative years. <laughs> It's been a joke since the first book came out to say shit like Hogwarts would get shut down by Ofsted, but to be clear, the fact that there's no oversight whatsoever for the majority of the school's questionable practices is pretty fucked up. Like, I get that they have super advanced and effective medical technology, or healing magic or whatever, but they can still, you know, die? They allow an 11 year old to fly hundreds of feet up in the air at insane speeds. The Nimbus 1000 is apparently believed to have reached speeds of up to 100 miles an hour, so the upgraded version presumably goes at least the same speed or faster, and they take kids into a dark forest filled with monsters with a big fella and a dog for protection as punishment for going out of bed at night, to name just a couple. Hogwarts itself is fraught with dangers from disappearing steps to giant three-headed dogs hidden behind a single door that can be opened with Alohomora, despite the fact that in later books, it's canonically established that there are spells you can put on doors to stop Alohomora working, and I know it would make for a more boring book, and a lot of the appeal of Harry Potter is the wonder of Hogwarts, but quite frankly, if I was a wizard, I'd be extremely concerned about sending my child to a school that appears not to have any kind of health and safety regulations, regularly has children suffer severe injuries, and even fucking die at a level to which it makes sense for them to have a fully equipped hospital on site, and actively chooses to put kids in danger at every possible opportunity. Oh, we have a long-standing tradition of forcing children to fight dragons? Yeah, sure, why not? It's character building. Hogwarts needs some serious oversight and regulation from some kind of external body to make sure that it's kept safe and up to standard. If it was, then frankly Umbridge would have had a harder time literally torturing students and daily life at Hogwarts wouldn't be so fraught with danger. But of course, you can't have any kind of oversight because that's socialism, right JK? And look, I understand that shortly afterwards the government was taken over by the Death Eaters, meaning that they would still have made it in in 1997, but that doesn't change the fact that for apparently hundreds of years beforehand, there was no regulation, no rules regarding the safety and well-being of the students, and no oversight whatsoever, which in my view is an extremely bad sign and has in the past led to slipping standards, abuse, and corruption corruption in our world. I'm not going to go into the stuff that happened either under Umbridge or the Carrows because, well, those were extreme circumstances and not business as usual, and we'll be talking about government overreach in the next section. <laughs> The position of defence against the dark arts teacher at Hogwarts is cursed, and the incumbent must be replaced every year, or at least such is the implication provided to us by Albus Dumbledore, and he would know. It is of course a huge undertaking to hire a qualified person willing to take on such a role on a yearly basis, especially considering the mortality rate, so I sort of understand that desperation might drive the school to take on entirely unqualified people, or even paranoid ex-cops with a short temper, and someone with wizard HIV, and yes, that is going to come up later on because fuck that comparison, but the fact is that if you're putting someone in a position of power over vulnerable kids who are already, as we established, likely to be struggling to emotionally deal with culture shock and abandonment issues stemming from being at a magic boarding school, you really should be implementing a proper vetting process. Someone like Alistair Moody should never have been hired whether he was a wizard Nazi in disguise or not, and likewise I understand the canon reason why Dumbledore decided to keep him around, but Snape really isn't the sort of person who should have any degree of power over young kids. He's verbally abusive, belittling, biased, and all around cruel to students he takes a dislike to, specifically in the books Neville, but of course he takes a pop at Hermione for being smart, and Harry because he reminds him of a high school bully or some shit. This part is linked to the last one, in that realistically this should be a formalised process and definitely shouldn't be churning out so many dangerous or incompetent weirdos to teach kids. 
One of them even turns out to be a terrorist in disguise, which I mean, that shouldn't be able to happen in such a high security place as Hogwarts. If Voldemort's plan was just to kill Harry rather than use him to come back from the dead, he would have died in book four, because as teacher he could have just fucking blown his head off in the first class he had with him. What if he just decided to go on a killing spree, clear out at least 50 kids before being stopped, and that's a low estimate. Fuck the system is corrupt, they don't care about us enough. Politicians had a chance for acting, stuck like a cast on the movement. So we're not progressing It always stays the same But we never learn the lesson Now everybody's stressing about Issues that they issue us The only issue is You miss the bigger picture Cause Fuck the government Last deceit, no receipts, their expenses getting leaked still, no prosecutions, barely. This section heading basically covers everything, so for now we're going to restrict the scope of this particular part of the video to specifically how the government as an organisation operates, not every single Pi Cornelius Fudge has his bell end in. <laughs> When I first found this out, when I realised that the Minister for Magic had such a level of influence over the Muggle Prime Minister, who in real life would have been John Major, but to be honest I suspect that Rowling may have just mixed up the dates and intended it to be Tony Blair, because he refers to his predecessor as male, and John Major's predecessor was Margaret Thatcher, especially considering that as the Ministry of Magic is called a ministry, and not an autonomous government, it does sort of imply that the Prime Minister would have ultimate control over such a body, like for example the Ministry of Defence, or the Ministry of Silly Walks, but that's just a naming error I suppose. Now the real issue is that the other minister gets to show up out of nowhere, tell the Prime Minister what to do, for example put out the story about Sirius Black, and then disappear again. The Mongol Prime Minister has no such authority over the Minister for Magic though, and according to Pottermore, apparently not one single Prime Minister has ever set foot in the Ministry of Magic, despite the fact that the opposite is apparently relatively common. It just seems rather odd that a foreign leader can have such a huge influence over the population of a whole Mughal nation through its democratically elected Prime Minister. We're told that the Prime Minister can't make threats to share the information about the Wizarding World because no one would believe him, but there are clearly ways to go about doing it that would provide definitive proof. Regardless, this first point isn't really a huge deal, but it's really annoying to me, and the way the Minister treats and talks to and about the Muggle Prime Minister really comes across as patronising. Look, I know it's only Tony Blair, and Tony Blair was a dickhead, but you can't just force your way into a foreign leader's private residence and make demands unless you're willing to give something in return, which considering that the Wizards have the power to cure all non-magic diseases and refuse to share that power is a little callous, if you ask me. <laughs> So as I just mentioned, I believe that some level of oversight and regulation in public services like education would be extremely positive. However, I can guarantee you that there are some Americans in the comments section already typing out some extremely long screed about how regulation leads to authoritarianism as demonstrated in Order of the Phoenix with the introduction of Dolores Umbridge, so let's talk about that now. Yes, in 1995, the Ministry for Magic was indeed guilty of a lot of serious overreach, and this is one of the many reasons that Fudge was deposed and Scrimger was installed as his replacement. However, However, I do believe that there should be some form of regulation in the education sector, even if that be from a non-politically affiliated independent body. Right, now that's out of the way, let's talk about government overreach. As an anarchist myself, I hate the idea of governments and leadership in general, and I think that the level of power and influence that the Ministry of Magic has over society is genuinely frightening. I mean, we in the Muggle world get a little upset when Laura Koonsberg demonstrates her barely concealed bias towards the Tories, and the UK press describes Jeremy Corbyn's bicycle as Mao-esque, but when times get tough, and the government really wants something done, the amount of power they display as well as a willingness to participate in some at best questionable practices is shocking. First of all they have the power to elect a teacher to Hogwarts if Dumbledore can't find one, which in this case is a power used to install a brutal fascist government agent into a school and refuse to acknowledge the abuses taking place as a result. And let's be honest here, if your kids told you that they were being physically abused and even tortured by a government appointed teacher, you wouldn't be keeping quiet about it. They know it's happening. And of course of course, this agent is mostly there to restrict free speech and thought, demand loyalty, and above all, push children into believing the government's way of thinking through an intense disinformation campaign. In other words, indoctrination. But it's not just through the school system that this propaganda is spread. Oh no, it becomes extremely clear throughout the rest of the series, from book 5 onwards, that the government has extreme levels of control over the press. Up until this point, I actually thought it was a little odd that there appeared to only be one newspaper throughout the whole of the UK wizarding press, but it soon became clear that this was the only 
only one able to keep running because it's controlled by the government. The ministry clearly not only has final approval, but considering some of the articles and headlines, full editorial approval over every story that gets published, to the point where it's deliberately printing outright lies about Harry and Voldemort, and at one point they even falsely arrest an innocent bus conductor based on lies in order to curry favour with the public. In short, in the wizarding world, the government has exclusive control over what information the public receive, and crucially, how this information is provided, and how it's framed. If you are concerned that the ministry might be a little authoritarian, well, there's your proof. <laughs> J.K. Rowling is a neoliberal. This much is obvious and extremely well documented. She's a Blairite status quo warrior who hates and fears progress, and specifically politicians who want to improve the plight of the poor and vulnerable. As a result, the government in her books is also overwhelmingly neoliberal, though it does tend to lean to the right in a couple of ways, which are the only ways it's ever criticised. We'll get into this more in a later section regarding the economy, but the vast majority of wealth in the wizarding economy appears to be in the hands of private enterprises. As I just mentioned, there's a severe lack of regulation, and and judging by the way the Weasleys live, austerity policies. Now, this would usually be fine in a story, but as we see play out not only in the books but in real life, neoliberalism can often be a gateway to corruption, extreme hypercapitalism, and in some cases, fascism. Unfortunately, because J.K. Rowling is not a great writer, we don't get to see the rise of the fascistic ideals demonstrated by the Ministry in Deathly Hallows with the Muggle-born wizard ban, magical theft and all that. It just seems to appear after Dumbledore dies, which is a shame, because it would have been a great opportunity to show the ways in which neoliberal philosophy has fallen to fascism in the wizarding world, just like it does in ours, beyond a couple of hints of authoritarianism in Book 5, but of course that would require Rowling to accept that neoliberalism is inherently flawed and fragile, and that oftentimes evil rising and taking control is a systemic issue not down to a few individuals making bad decisions. After all, after Voldemort's death, Kingsley Shacklebolt <sighs> Kingsley Shacklebolt is named minister, and the neoliberal ministry continues as before, with no safeguards or changes made. The bad people are gone now, the status quo is restored, and this can never happen again, so let's not examine the system in any kind of depth. <laughs> Technically, the Minister of Magic is mostly democratically elected, but we don't really know many details about the political process or how the government is run. Are there a number of political parties? What are they? What do they run on? What are their main policy positions? Do the people vote? And if so, how? And crucially, how is there a democratically elected leader who many people we come across throughout the books vehemently disagree with, but not once does anyone speculate about voting for anyone else, or have arguments over which party leader would be preferable, or even utter the phrase, you voted for this in an argument which, if you've ever had a political discussion with a family member, you know is inevitable. In fact, it seems like no one is really all that interested in discussing serious political issues at all, which is very odd. It just seems like a bit of a wasted opportunity, really. Imagine how much more complex and interesting Voldemort's infiltration of government could have been if he'd actually won an election, or used a charismatic puppet like Lucius Malfoy to do so. It certainly would have been more realistic. After all, generally fascists don't rise to power by walking to Parliament with 12 of their mates and hypnotising the Prime Minister to their side, they get politicians sympathetic to their cause elected and then through that figurehead enact their policies. Or they attempt a military coup, which considering that the magical world doesn't seem to have a military is relatively unlikely. I just think it's a huge shame that we never really see anyone question the status quo or hear any serious opposing viewpoints on the way things are run. Like we get Hermione being the only one who cares about the literal slavery going on, but everyone else sort of laughs at her. The goblins are shown to be treated as second class citizens who aren't allowed to use wands, and these kinds of social issues are just never really brought up or discussed in any depth. It's a missed opportunity to inject some nuance is all I'm saying. As things are, it appears that the population are either just resigned to the reality of the situation or are aware that they have very little say in the matter. After all, apparently in some cases a minister doesn't even have to be elected, they can just be chosen to be leader, without any say from the people whatsoever, which to be honest sounds like a recipe for disaster. Emergency powers and all that, very palpatine. It is with great reluctance that I have agreed to this calling. I love democracy. I love the Republic. The power you give me, I will lay down when this crisis has abated. In order to ensure the security and continuing stability, the Republic will be reorganized into the first Galactic 
As Pottermore puts it, the Ministry of Magic was formally established in 1707 with the appointment of the very first man to hold the title Minister for Magic, Ulrich Gamp. The Minister for Magic is democratically elected, though there have been times of crisis in which the post has simply been offered to an individual without a public vote. Albus Dumbledore was made such an offer and turned it down repeatedly. There is no fixed limit to a minister's time of office, but he or she is obliged to hold regular elections at a maximum interval of seven years. Ministers for Magic tend to last much longer than Muggle ministers, generally speaking speaking, and despite many a moan and grumble, their community is behind them in a way that is rarely seen in the Muggle world. This is perhaps due to a feeling on the part of wizards that unless they're seen to manage themselves competently, the Muggles might try to interfere. It's weird, right? Not even mentioning the weird shit about being seen to manage themselves competently in front of the Muggles who don't know they even exist, it's rather concerning that there are no imposed term limits, and that those terms are so long. I don't know, it may be a democratic system on the surface, but in practice it definitely doesn't appear that way, and it's therefore relatively easy to infiltrate and use up, which of course happened in 1997. Probably the most important part of any society is the economy. Who controls it, what kind of wealth disparity is there, how does commerce function, what is the purpose of work, and so on and so forth. Obviously, as a far-left soy boy cuck, and someone who JK Rowling herself would likely be very wary of, considering her own ladder-hoisting, neo-centrist, centre-right ideals, I'm extremely interested in how ownership of the means of production is organised. I'm not going to go into the completely insane way the denominations are organised, because it was only relatively recently that we in the UK accepted decimalised currency, and it was at the time pretty strongly resisted, so you know, glass houses and all that. I travel abroad a lot. Well, when we go abroad, you don't get as much mileage to, the, to it, and therefore, you're going to use more petrol, and then they say, oh, so many miles, right? Well, you're not doing that. You're not going to do the mileage, what they say you're going to do, because the kilometres are not the same as the mileage, it's shorter. <laughs> it's the Treaty of Rome, as my husband would say. Everything's being de decimalised. Horrible, I can't bear it. Well, Lewis, you're not all our national heritage, aren't we? Like what? Well, like, you know, the money's all changed, the decimalisation, all the weights being changed, measurements and everything. And I think, you know, we're an island on our own, you know, and let's face it, we once ruled the world, didn't we? You know? And now we're just being part of a community. I don't agree with it at all. I've got a little old saying, it may not be any, any beneficial to people like you. They had a little bloke with a moustache like that. His name was Chamberlain. He was a Prime Minister. So now we're going to fight a war to make it a better land to live in. That was for me. I was 19 years of age. Did 10 years in the war come back here and now everybody wants to change the way that I want to fall for. It ain't right, I want it as it is now. What I really, really sacrificed my life for. <laughs> Yeah, you knew this was coming. I have a whole series, well actually it's only two videos so far, but I'm planning more. Does it count as a series if there's two? Or is it like serial killers where you have to kill three people or make three videos for it to be a series? I don't know. Called How Capitalism Ruined Your Life. What, did you think I wasn't going to take this opportunity to complain about capitalism again? You know better than that. Okay, so for the most part I'm kidding, but in the interest of being completely transparent here, I actually genuinely hate capitalism in our non-magical muggle society for a number of reasons, which is evident not only throughout my work, but leftist philosophy in general, so I'm not going to waste both of our time by going over 200 years of anti-capitalist rhetoric, but I would invite you to look it up yourself. But it's not just that I hate capitalism in general, but I think it's especially egregious in the magical world. How, you may ask? Well, allow me to explain. <laughs> Imagine you lived in a world where you can literally do anything you want by waving a stick around and speaking Latin. It's a world with almost limitless possibilities and endless promise. Now imagine the kind of society that takes a situation like that and somehow still enforces an economic system that allows for the existence of poverty. It's honestly astonishing the lengths that would have to be reached in order to do that. No, seriously, think about it. Why does poverty in our world exist? Well, in general, it's because of inequality and the wealthy hoarding obscene amounts of money, like angry dragons sitting at the top of their piles of gold, and our current neoliberal theory of trickle-down economics, which has pretty definitively been 
shown to be a load of bollocks by now, austerity and reverse Robin Hood tactics, but in essence, it's scarcity. In a world of limitless possibilities, why would this still be acceptable? Take the Weasleys, for example. Arthur Weasley heads up his own government department and yet wages are apparently so dismal that his family still has to live in a bunch of sheds held together with magic. Lupin starts 1993, poor as fuck, and apparently doesn't get paid enough to buy new clothes by the end of an entire year, being in charge of teaching every wizard child in the country, and yet Lucius Malfoy, who does something in government. I don't actually know what his job is and apparently it's not clear because the Harry Potter wiki is also unsure. Probably just rich people stuff like owning land or something. Anyway, Lucius Malfoy can live in a manor with peacocks and shit and Arthur Weasley lives in a converted shed. This is classic late capitalism. The wealth disparity is disgusting and just like our world, escaping poverty seems almost impossible as well. Unless you get seriously lucky or somehow get access to a ton of free money, like being given some by a rich kid who has a whole vault overflowing with gold that he doesn't use to improve the world in any real way for example, and opening up a business is apparently the only real way to earn a decent living, judging by the adults we meet in the books. But why does anyone even need work if all it takes is one sandwich to cast a replication spell on in order to create a never ending meal, and to a greater extent literally end world hunger, but I guess the muggles not finding out about Diagon Alley is more important than the billions of deaths caused by starvation every year? Well, in the capitalist mindset, to designate yourself as worthy of being alive, but the real reason is because the capitalist system is inefficient and cruel, and mostly exists to keep the workers desperate and insecure in their positions by artificially restricting important and essential resources. In other words, <laughs> The thing is, in our world it kinda makes sense on a surface level for poverty to exist under a capitalist system, unjust though it is. After all, resources like food, water, shelter and so on are often behind a paywall, accessible only to those with the money to pay for them. Don't get me wrong, there are food banks, charities and organisations to help people in need, but it's in no way a realistic solution to the problem and is at best a band-aid. After all, if you want somewhere to live, you have to have a spare two months rent lying around to pay your landlord. If you want water, you have to be able to pay your water bill. If you want food, you have to be able to either buy it or show up to a food bank and hope that they have what you need and aren't one of those ones that only accept you if you have a referral from the council. But why would such a system still exist in a world where everyone has a stick that can turn a few shacks into a multi-story house, can conjure water from nothing, and can replicate or transform food seemingly with no limit? Well, I don't know the answer to this, but suffice to say that it must be pretty significant and oppressive to be able to compel people to participate in a system of wage slavery in a post-scarcity society. It's quite dystopian, really. In Star Trek, after the invention of the replicator, capitalism basically ends and money stops existing because it's obsolete, but in Harry Potter, post-scarcity just sort of continues the status quo? I guess you could argue that specific resources like wands and cauldrons and shit are behind a paywall, but I mean, it's not like they cost that much and most people have the same one from age 11. I guess if you are particularly conspiratorial, you could perhaps construct a narrative in which the globalist elite controls the population and the economy in order to stop the pure-blooded Aryan wizards from achieving their full potential, but considering that the people in charge of the banking system are described as untrustworthy, bold, hook-nosed, conniving creatures with long fingers and pointed beards, and literally have a star of David on the floor of Gringotts, well, that might get you in a little bit of trouble and a fully justified punch in the face, you fucking Nazi. Am I saying that JK Rowling's goblins are deliberately intended to be anti-Semitic? No, of course not, but am I saying that she's unthinkingly embedded centuries of anti-Semitic caricatures designed to demonise Jews into the best-selling book series of all time without once considering the repercussions and then subsequently failed to apologise or even acknowledge what she'd done? Yes. Yes, I am. Positive representation is only okay in baseless statements after the fact on Twitter, not actually put into the text. Don't want to upset the homophobic book-buying parents, after all, you have to have that plausible deniability that Dumbledore might not be gay, and then it might just be fan fiction after the fact. Negative representation, based on literally centuries-old prejudices though, that's absolutely fine. Shove it in the first fucking book, why not? <laughs> Tied into this concept of late capitalism, manufactured scarcity, or as Chomsky put it, manufactured consent, and lack of upwards mobility or ability for the working class to escape the poverty unnecessarily forced upon them, is the concept of inherited wealth, which frankly shouldn't exist. All it does is perpetuate the status quo by slowly concentrating a higher and higher portion of the wealth in fewer and fewer hands, and those at the top accumulate more and more. There's less to go around for those at the bottom, and we get to a point where one man could end world hunger tomorrow without even knowing 
noticing a difference, whilst billions die from lack of access to clean drinking water, and Bill Gates whines about the concept of only having six billion dollars if Bernie Sanders decides to take the rest of his money away, which is not something anyone's even suggested by the way. According to official canon, the Malfoy family started accumulating their wealth when Armand Malfoy Armand, Ar Armand, came to Britain during the Norman invasion of 1066 and negotiated a prime piece of land in Wiltshire from William the Conqueror in exchange for services rendered, which probably means that the Normans won because of magic or something. Why not, I guess. But this is a serious problem, and one that in a more organised and less socially stratified society might be solved at the end of a guillotine. This means that when a dragon hoarding gold dies, the gold cannot simply be used to improve the world or help alleviate societal problems, but is instead passed on to the dragon's next of kin. The dragon is not the individual person who holds the gold, but their entire line, their descendants potentially going on forever, or at least for a thousand years. Look at how fucked up our economic system is, the massive levels of wealth disparity leading to eight people having as much wealth as four billion, whilst children in the third world are forced to die due to lack of resources, or forced into basically slave labour. And our version of capitalism, despite its massive death toll, has only been around for a couple of hundred years. How much worse must magic capitalism be? No wonder someone like Arthur Weasley can barely afford to get by despite running a government department. Lucius Malfoy probably owns two thirds of the economy, if current trends are anything to go by, extrapolating outwards. This is the story about the man called the Ganja Man. A long story about the biggest man from Nazgaban. He take you with ya, he come not with ya. Ah. As we have discussed a couple of times before on this channel, the current prison system, both in the UK and US, is in serious need of reform. In the US it's significantly worse due to a number of factors, notably the war on drugs, privatisation of the prison system and a constitutional amendment that allows for a loophole in the ban on slavery, and frankly the brutal treatment of many prisoners, and that's without even going into detention facilities like Guantanamo, the detainment facilities that served as sites of various war crimes in the Middle East and early noughties, little concentration camps on the US-Mexico border and the use of techniques deemed to be torture by the UN Human Rights Council. But in comparison to Azkaban, these places and these systems pale by comparison. <laughs> They don't need walls and water to keep the prisoners in, not when they're trapped inside their own heads, incapable of a single cheerful thought, most go mad within weeks. On the surface, based on the name and location as a remote island, Azkaban prison reminds the reader of Alcatraz, the famously unescapable American prison from which three prisoners managed to get out and probably die in the attempt to cross the massive body of water between Alcatraz and mainland USA. But I would argue that whilst Alcatraz is a superficially apt concept, I would say that ideologically and based on the philosophy of Azkaban's existence, a better comparison might be Guantanamo Bay. And don't just take my word for it, here is an actual detainee at Guantanamo who endured years of torture and abuse making the direct comparison. You know they got, they got an island in Harry Potter It says Azbakan, where there's no happiness, they, 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 you know, they just suck all your feelings out of you and you don't, you don't have no feeling anymore. And truly, that's how I felt all the time, is this is Azbakan, this is not from this world, you know, because that's what they tried, you know, they want to make you feelingless. As Pottermore put it, Azkaban has existed since the 15th century and was not originally a prison at all. It was originally home to a little known sorcerer who'd called himself Ekridzis, who was believed to have been insane and was a practitioner of the worst kinds of dark arts. Those who entered to investigate Azkaban refused afterwards to talk of what they had found inside, but the least frightening part of it was that the place was infested with dementors. Once the international statute of secrecy had been imposed, the Ministry of Magic felt that the small wizarding prisons that existed up and down the country in various towns and villages posed as security risk. A purpose-built prison located on some remote Hebridean island was preferred, and plans had been drawn up when Damocles Raoul became Minister for Magic. Raoul scrapped the plans for a new prison at once and insisted on using Azkaban. He claimed that the Dementors living there were an advantage, they could be harnessed as guards, saving the Ministry time, trouble and expense. Raoul carried out his plan and soon a steady trickle of prisoners had been placed there. None ever emerged. If they were not mad and dangerous before being placed in Azkaban, they swiftly became so. By the time that Eldritch Diggory took over as Minister for Magic, prison had been operating for 15 years. There'd been no breakouts and no breaches of security. The new prison seemed to be working well. As of Eldritch Diggory,
centuries visit in the 1730s or 1740s, a graveyard had been established on the island to accommodate those who had died in the prison. Most of the prisoners inside its walls died of despair, having lost the will to live. This is due to the presence of Dementor guards on the island. Dementors drain people of all happiness and leave them with their worst memories. Long-term exposure usually leads to insanity and even death. Azkaban started being used as a prison in 1718, and it wasn't until some point in the ministership of Kingsley Shacklebolt, which as far as we know is from 1997 to sometime in the late noughties, that the Dementors were all replaced by Auras, basically wizard cops, and yes, before anyone brings it up, all Auras are bastards. Which frankly is not much of an achievement, considering that all the Dementors joined Voldemort during the Second Wizarding War anyway, and the fact that it's still apparently in use, despite its history, is really quite disheartening, considering that the fortress itself is apparently still evil, and affects people in pretty horrific ways, even without the Dementors, but then again, judging by Rowling's track record, I guess the best we can hope for is making prisoners miserable is fine, just so long as they don't get their souls eaten or something. What a compromise. The British prison system is fine, which is why the Chief Inspector of Prisons recently described the situation thusly. I realise that in recent years, many prisons, short of staff and investment, have struggled to maintain even basic standards of security and decency. Some prisons, in very difficult circumstances, have made valiant efforts to improve. Others, sadly, have failed to tackle the basic problems of violence, drugs and disgraceful living conditions that have beset so many jails in recent years. I've seen instances where both staff and prisoners alike seem to have become inured to conditions that should not be accepted in 21st century Britain. But unlike Guantanamo, which was at the time of its establishment in January 2002, described by Donald Rumsfeld as having been established to detain extraordinarily dangerous people, to interrogate detainees in an optimal setting, and to prosecute for war crimes, though of course, in practice it's mostly been used for enemy combatants. Azkaban isn't designed to be an extreme contingency to contain and interrogate particularly dangerous individuals, but the only prison that apparently exists in the wizarding world inflicts lasting damage on its prisoners, and you can be sent there for relatively minor crimes like having dangerous pets or pretending to be a zombie. Oh, and also you get your prisoner number tattooed on you for life, which is fun, definitely not an extremely weird and pointless holocaust allegory, and is not supported by the author's confirmation that the name is partially inspired by the Hebrew word for despair, obviously. <laughs> It's a great irony that one of the many crimes that can get you sent to Azkaban and suffer egregious and brutal torture at the hands of the Dementors acting as government agents is the use of a spell designed to inflict torture upon others. You might call it karma, but I would call it hypocrisy. And Azkaban is very much a torture facility. Apart from all the horrendous stuff stemming from the Dementors or the building itself, each prisoner is in solitary confinement, which in itself is considered a pretty extreme method of torture and can lead to people losing their minds, even without misery ghosts eating their souls or whatever. Let's talk about torture. This should be quite a short discussion because there are in essence only two real arguments that are made here. First, torture is a great deterrent, and second, torture is a great way to extract information. The short answer is that in our world, neither of these statements ring true. In fact, as multiple studies have now shown, torture doesn't really deter criminals, it just increases resentment or distrust towards the government. This carries across to the wizarding world too. After all, it's not like dark wizards and dark magic stop existing. In fact, there's a whole offshoot from Diagon Alley that appears to be dedicated to it, or are deterred by by their time in Azkaban. After all, the Death Eaters that break out don't just settle down and stop being magical Nazis, now do they? As for extracting information, well, in our world it's extremely ineffective because all it does is encourage the prisoner to say whatever they think will make the torture stop, regardless of how accurate it is. But in the Wizarding world, it's fucking pointless for this reason, because they've got a potion that literally forces you to tell the truth, so why even bother to continue with the upkeep of such a barbaric system? Well... <laughs> The Wizarding World system of justice is, unsurprisingly, very much similar to that of the UK or USA, which I brought up in my video about the rise of fascism in the US, a video which really upset American right-wingers who didn't have any good rebuttals to put in the comments, so just gave me a thumbs down. Huge winning the battle of ideas. So I'll be brief in discussing it now. Essentially, there are two main philosophies when it comes to the discussion of justice. Retributive justice and rehabilitative justice. Obviously, it's more complex than that in reality, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll just use the main two. The purpose of Retributive justice, which is what most prison systems around the globe, for example the US prison system, are based on, revolves around a simple principle, justice as punishment, and to a lesser extent deterrent. This is how you get someone like the US and its often horrific prison system brutality, and as I just mentioned, in a lot of places, even slavery. The problem with retributive justice, however, is that, quite frankly, it doesn't work. It has sky-high recidivism rates, and is often just considered barbaric and ineffective by almost every single study that has been carried out by independent sources. Rehabilitative 
justice on the other hand is based around the philosophy of, you guessed it, rehabilitation. And rather than focusing on making the prisoners as miserable as possible and punishing them for the rest of their lives for their life choices, actually concentrating on getting them to a point where they can re-enter society and start giving back, reintegrate in a positive manner, after having been deemed safe and no longer a risk, of course, using therapy and empathy to understand and hopefully change these often troubled individuals. After all, most crime is not caused by inherently evil people, and understanding that is the first step in preventing further crime. There are some who call this approach soft, and that if you commit a crime you should be punished, but much like every other right-wing argument, that is an argument from feelings, not facts. The facts and the data overwhelmingly show that rehabilitative justice is provably more effective than retributive justice. Take the US and Norway as examples. The US has the largest prison population in the world, and often treats prisoners poorly and inhumanely, even to the point of using them as firefighters, unpaid of course, due to this philosophy of punishment, and yet in the US the crime recidivism rate is almost 80%. In Norway, which has a much more laid back approach, in fact the longest sentence you can ever get is 21 years for any crime, allows criminals a degree of luxury and autonomy, indeed a high security prison is more akin to a college dorm than a traditional prison, and has a huge focus on therapy and rehabilitation. The crime recidivism rate in Norway is 20%. It may be less viscerally satisfying, and there may be a lot of people who cry foul, but the numbers do not lie. <laughs> In the muggle world, there is a certain level of fairness and equity that one can expect from the legal system should one be in the unfortunate position of being accused of having broken the law in some way. For example, in the UK you have the right to a fair trial with the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, legal aid and of course the right to legal representation. There's also the right to be tried by a jury of peers and in the case of an ambiguous or uncertain verdict, the burden of proof is on the prosecution, not the defence. This however doesn't seem to be entirely applicable to wizarding trials which are heard by the Wizengamot. As the wiki puts it, trials appear to be brief and concise. The accused may present witnesses to be questioned by the Wazengamot. A third party with legal knowledge may speak on behalf of a defendant, fulfilling a similar role to that of a modern barrister. However, no wizarding lawyers seem to exist, and the practice of having a spokesperson on behalf of a defendant appears to be rare. So no right to legal representation and no wizard lawyers at all, which I would argue isn't exactly a fair trial. If Harry hadn't had Dumbledore, he'd have been fucked, because having grown up in the muggle world, he'd have no clue about wizarding law whatsoever. Even less than the average wizard who, to be honest, is also probably clueless. I wouldn't be able to represent myself in a trial. I know fuck all about the law, and I've lived in our society for all my life. It's unclear as to whether there's even a jury, though I would wager probably not, as one isn't mentioned in the books. Judging by the film version of events, it appears that the members of the Wizengamot, who look to be senior ministry officials, get to make the decision, which is rather concerning. After all, the point of the jury system is to make sure that there are unlikely to be any biases, because they're all just random strangers. The Wazengamot, on the other hand, is mostly made up of the minister and his presumably hand-picked, or at least approved, judicial members. Umbridge is there, and I doubt that's a coincidence. It's weird, really, that they bother with the whole trial at all, considering the existence of Veritasium. <laughs> oh. That would be good, though, wouldn't it? Veritasium. What am I doing with my life? Anyway, considering the existence of Veritaserum, why not just give Harry a mug of spiked tea and then he'll be forced to tell the truth and either way they'll know. I know it's basically a sham trial and Fudge is being unreasonable, but other than the fact that the charges are trumped up, the lack of Veritaserum isn't commented upon and therefore it would be reasonable to assume it's not out of the ordinary. Lincoln called him a fanatic and he was a Christian who thought you could do one to others as you'd have others do unto you. Christ said, love your neighbor, and if your neighbor's held in slavery, he was one who felt his duty was to fight to set them free. I think that we're probably mostly in agreement that slavery is bad, as is racism, or at least those of us on the left are, our right-leaning pals have yet to pick that up. But in the world of Harry Potter, slavery is alive and well, and whilst the author may have had quite a few issues regarding race, the wizarding world, for the most part, is less concerned with race and more with species, which has its own problematic baggage attached. I've already talked about the goblin thing, so I won't be repeating myself here, but that's only the most widely discussed example of this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
J.K. Rowling has on multiple occasions stated that Remus Lupin's struggle with lycanthropy, that's being a werewolf for those of you who aren't losers like me who know all about lycanthropy, was a very deliberate metaphor for HIV. Lupin's condition of lycanthropy was a metaphor for those illnesses that carry a stigma, like HIV and AIDS. All kinds of superstitions seem to surround bloodborne conditions, probably due to taboos surrounding the blood itself. The wizarding community is as prone to hysteria and prejudice as the muggle one, and the character of Lupin gave me a chance to examine those attitudes. There are a number of issues I can take with this, the main one being that it lacks all subtlety or nuance. Yes, HIV and lycanthropy both carry a stigma and are both completely misunderstood by society at large, and I suppose you could make the connection based on the hysteria and prejudice surrounding both, but the problem is that when you make a serious one-to-one -one comparison like that, you have to be extremely careful because you could easily find yourself accidentally implying some pretty offensive shit. You see, the thing about HIV is that for most of its history it was seen as a gay disease, and this was one of the many reasons the, at the time, incredibly homophobic American government dragged its feet in reacting to the crisis. It was blamed on the gay lifestyle for decades, but the main issue is that it simply doesn't work as a comparison. Until extremely recently, contracting HIV was a death sentence, and lycanthropy quite simply well isn't. I suppose you could argue that the potion Snape gives to Lupin so that he retains his mind during transformation might be a metaphor for the life-saving medication we have access to today, which stops the progression of HIV in its tracks. But let's be honest here, there's one pretty horrendous decision that quite frankly is unforgivable when it comes to invoking the comparison between a fictional magical affliction and a deadly disease, and that is the character of Fenrir Greyback. For those of you who don't know, Fenrir Greyback is an evil werewolf Death Eater who is described in the text like this. Fenrir Greyback is perhaps the most savage werewolf alive today. He regards it as his mission in life to bite and to contaminate as many people as possible. He wants to create enough werewolves to overcome the wizards. Voldemort has promised him prey in return for his services. Greyback specialises in children. Bite them young, he says, and raise them away from their parents. Raise them to hate normal wizards. Yep, this is a man with metaphorical HIV, which demographically probably makes makes him a sexually active gay man who not only enjoys, but sees it as his mission in life to contaminate as many people as possible with magic HIV, and most disturbingly, prefers to prey on children. So let's just get this straight. If this metaphor were one to one, as JK Rowling did suggest, we've got a gay man with HIV who deliberately passes the virus on to not only other unsuspecting adults, which is already fucked up, but also children, who he then kidnaps and raises in isolation from the rest of society. And this is one of only two werewolves we ever meet in this story. This is either a really clumsy, poorly thought out metaphor, or incredibly offensive to people with HIV. <laughs> Slavery exists in Harry Potter. No, I don't care that house elves are based on English folk tales about dobbies and brownies or that in canon they want to be subservient. It's fucked up that slavery of any form exists and the fact that Hermione is repeatedly portrayed as the crazy one for wanting to, again, end slavery is just mind-blowing. There are, surprisingly, actually laws on elf welfare in the books, at least according to the Harry Potter wiki, but these are not abided by at all because clearly they have a pretty seriously bad deal of it. Yes, there's obviously some kind of indoctrination at hand that encourages them not to complain or seek freedom, but no civilised society should be in any way okay with any form of slavery. It's unacceptable, and the fact that they're even in a school is unbelievable. It's even illegal for them to own wands. If it was consensual, why would there need to be a law like that? As Dumbledore once described Harry's slave, creature is what he's been made by wizards, Harry. Yes, he is to be pitied. His existence has been as miserable as your friend Dobby's. He was forced to do serious his bidding because Sirius was the last of the family to which he was enslaved, but he felt no true loyalty to him, and whatever Creature's faults, it must be admitted that Sirius did nothing to make Creature's lot easier. And as far as we know, this practice still continues, despite the founder and leader of the Society for the Protection of Elven Welfare being Minister for Magic for a time. <laughs> Just a brief point here, it's really quite fascinating to me that all the main characters in the series are white, despite race rarely if ever being brought up, except when it's about to be, you know, a thing. For example, in 1996, Lavender Brown is this cute, enthusiastic, chirpy blonde girl because she's dating Ron, a white man, and we can't have any miscegenation in our children's book series now, can we? And we can guess that this was a pretty significant and deliberate choice made here, because Lavender Brown was actually, in the first five movies, mostly without a speaking role. This is what she looked like before her character was supposed to date Ron, a white man. And yes, okay, you could make the race-blind casting argument. After all, in The Cursed Child, Hermione is black, but 
that wasn't written by Rowling, and as far as I know, she actually had extremely limited influence over the final product. I'm sure it had nothing to do with the fact that the movies will live on forever, and the play lasted a couple of years before being shelved due to it being unbelievably shit. Look, I like the idea of Hermione being black, but you can't use that for clout after not bothering to really write any significant amount of racially diverse characters in either the seven books or now ten movies you've made, just because someone else made a play that you didn't really have anything to do with and was willing to do something you never were. Also, can we just briefly talk about the weirdly stereotypical names of all the non-white characters? Padma and Parvati Patil. Wonder what race they are. Cho Chang. Hmm. Kingsley Shacklebolt. The Caribbean Black Man. Jesus Christ. And so on. It's a very weird decision, right? I don't know about you, but I know a lot of non-white people with less stereotypical names, and if I was to make up a fictional person of colour, I'd probably avoid calling the black guy Kingsley Shacklebolt and the Asian kid Cho Chang. I'm not going to go into all the horrendously ignorant shit she does with the various different foreign wizards too much because, oh boy, did she fuck that one up. So all of Africa, the second largest and most populous continent on the planet, has just one school, does it? And yet Britain, France and Russia have one each. All Native American tribes are the exact same, right? African wizards don't have modern western technology like wands and just use their hands like primitives, do they? Fuck off with that. <laughs> If you watch my videos, you're probably aware of Lindsay Ellis. She's probably the single best video essayist and media commentator on this platform, and if you haven't already, you should go watch her stuff now. One of her best videos, in my opinion, is a video essay she made about Bright and how it fails to adequately build a convincing world in which to set its story. And I think the same could be said of the wizarding world in a couple of ways, but the main one is a similar one to Bright. The problem of allegorical racism. It can work, but only if you're very, very smart about it, and rolling, I hate to say Say it is not. Chance the Rapper commented in a tweet after watching Bright, I always feel a little cheated when I see allegorical racism in movies because that racism usually stems from human emotion or tolerance, but not by law or systems the way it is in real life. The world of this movie reaches for edgy and topical, but is just lazy and careless. And the language of bigotry in these movies is so cartoonish that no one would see it in themselves. This is a popular go-to when trying to capture the language of casual racism in movies. Yes, white bitterness about affirmative action and corporate diversity initiatives is certainly a thing. But this captures that bitterness poorly, because if you use the actual language of casual racism, you run the risk of offending casual racists, which is a huge demographic. So you use the language of cartoon casual racism, and never have to run the risk of making the audience question whether they are seeing themselves in the bad guys. Reduce the outcome of racism to a kick-me sign, and justify racism and bigotry by pointing to historical events where entire ethnic groups made an oopsie-daisy. Fantasy world-building is always going to be a reflection of the author's experiences, and you will have blind spots or biases that will manifest themselves in the work. The problem isn't just that this world is too close to our own, so inevitably you can't help but impose our world logic onto it. It isn't just that being on the nose with your race allegory might read as tone deaf. Really, it's just that it's incurious and lazy, but it doesn't want to be. And that is what makes it disappointing. You see, Rowling is a big fan of ignoring real-world prejudices and instead writing in magical allegorical versions of them. As we just went over, lycanthropy stands in for HIV sufferers, arguably goblins stand in for Jewish people, and the prejudices they suffer, and so on. But there's a problem with this. Namely, that you can't make exact one-to-one -one comparisons like this without giving the fictional world a lot of thought, as we just mentioned. The goblin thing comes off as offensive, the HIV thing comes off as making people suffering from a disease come off as some kind of child predator, and of course there's the attempt to use the plight of the Muggle-born wizards as a direct allegory for oppressed racial groups. Yes, it's very clever that the Nazis were obsessed with blood purity, and there was a whole one-drop bullshit as well. Good job on that one. But the comparison frankly isn't really there. Are we talking black people? Is that the allegory here? It seems the most apt in our modern world, but if that is the case it just doesn't work. Muggle-borns never had to grow up experiencing the prejudice, they didn't experience their parents receiving abuse on the street, they didn't start seeing abuse basically from birth and so on. Basically, these are just kids who discover at age 11 that some people don't like them for some weird reason, and that's not really analogous to any real-world racism that I know of. I might be inclined to argue that maybe it's about trans people, considering that in Deathly Hallows the Muggleborns are accused of stealing magic by illegitimate means, which could be a very clever allegory for the turf argument that trans women pretend to be women in order to gain access to female spaces, and a lot of other biological essentialism bullshit that one can very easily compare to transphobic rhetoric nowadays, but as we'll discuss in the next section of this video, I find that extremely unlikely considering that JK Rowling is likely a turf. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
As if any more evidence of Rowling's complete lack of understanding of race issues was needed, allow me to quote from an interview she gave in the year 2000. She, Rowling, explains at length and somewhat defensively that the school had to be a boarding school because most of the magic happens in the middle of the night, and if it was a day school you wouldn't get the same sense of community. She also argues that, in a way, Harry does reflect the modern world because he's mixed race, his dad being a wizard, his mum being a muggle, human, witch. Which seems to be pushing it a bit, yeah. So rather than actually putting any explicitly mixed race characters into the series, Series, or writing any kind of nuanced take on mixed race issues, Rowling claims that actually the protagonist was mixed race the whole time, despite being Snow White because his mum was muggle born. Not even a muggle, just muggle born. And this is what passes for racial diversity now, apparently. If you're gay, then you're gay. Don't pretend that you're straight. You could be who you are any day of the week. You are unlike the others, so strong and unique. We're all with you. Hey, did you know that JK Rowling is probably a turf? Because if not, just FYI, JK Rowling is probably a turf. Beyond that though, she's really quite weird about sex as a whole as well, especially when it comes to LGBTQ plus stuff. Everyone is aware by now of Rowling's performative, retroactive wokeness, which we just discussed, but really this was the progenitor of the whole thing. Dumbledore being gay is on the one hand great, because it's cool LGBTQ plus representation, but on the other it's cowardly and reeks of fence-sitter energy. <laughs> You knew this was coming. It's probably the most talked about and most criticised part of Rowling's post-Deathly Hallows work, and even now it still continues to plague her. You could maybe have argued that 2007 wasn't a great time for a gay Dumbledore, but in the 12 years since then we've evolved, gay marriage is a thing now, the LGBTQ plus movement is pretty mainstream, and most importantly, the whole world knows that Dumbledore is gay, and apparently had an extremely active sex life with Grindelwald. It's a huge part of his identity as a character now, but it seems that Rowling is unwilling to acknowledge his sexuality in the text, even after all this time. In The Crimes of Grindelwald, the terrible movie she wrote that came out in 2018, Dumbledore is confronted by some wizard cops who want him to fight Grindelwald, but he refuses, because otherwise JK Rowling wouldn't be able to exploit this franchise for everything it's worth, and risk alienating some fringe homophobes. And then this scene happens. I need you to fight him. I can't. Because of this. You and Grindelwald were as close as brothers. Oh, we were closer than brothers. Yeah, even after all these years, as Rowling has seen the huge strides the LGBTQ plus movement has taken since 2007, to a point where revealing Dumbledore to be gay in canon in the text wouldn't even be shocking or a big deal or anything, and she still can't bring herself to do it. 
She can hint at it, but she can't do it. I swear the last movie in this franchise better have an explicit flashback sex scene to make up for this or I'm gonna lose my shit. Rowling had the perfect opportunity to actually put her money where her mouth is, so to speak, when it came to being a real LGBTQ plus ally. Give the gays their representation, give younger, closeted gay kids the role model they've been missing, but nope, can't have that. What if the homophobic parents get a little upset or uncomfortable about the concept of a fictional gay wizard who works as a school teacher? Let's keep it subtle to appease the bigots, right? <laughs> So the wizarding world has the hypno in it. Actually, no, that's not fair, it's much worse than that. Fred and George, the fun-loving pranksters, are literally selling date rape drugs to kids, both at school before they leave and after they set up their joke shop. Let me explain. In the wizarding world, spiking someone's food or drink with a love potion will cause that person to become obsessed with you, utterly infatuated by the idea of you, and will do literally anything to please you and worship at your feet. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Spiking someone's drink with a love potion will lead them to becoming extremely pliable and manipulable, to the point where coercing them into sex or something else they may not otherwise be willing or happy to engage in becomes incredibly easy. This is a rape drug, pure and simple, and we've actually seen it being used in this way too. Voldemort's mother repeatedly raped his father over a period of years through the use of a love potion, and in 1996, a sex criminal known as Romilda Vane attempted to use a box of spiked chocolates to rape Harry Potter. The victims of these horrendous crimes are, of course, innocent, and as I said, total victims of a sex crime. But the narrative rarely acknowledges this. In fact, Rowling herself implied that one of the main reasons that Voldemort was evil was because he was conceived as a result of rape. It was a symbolic way of showing that he came from the Loveless Union. The enchantment under which Tom Riddle fathered Voldemort is important because it shows coercion, and there can't be many more prejudicial ways to enter the world than as the result of such a union. I'm sure the kids of rape survivors really appreciate that, Joe. Thanks for that. And the same can be said of enchantments. As we see in the Crimes of Grindelwald movie, Queenie uses one to literally force Jacob, her partner, to break the law, run away to Britain, and marry her, entirely under magical coercion. Anyway, we are real excited to be here, Newt. This is a, well, it's a special trip for us. You see, Jacob and I, we're getting married. <laughs> I married Jacob. <laughs> Oh. You've enchanted him, haven't you? What? <laughs> I have not. <laughs> Will you stop reading my mind? Queenie, you've brought him here against his will. Oh, that is an outrageous accusation. Look at him. He's just happy. So happy. Then you won't mind if I am. Um... <clears throat> Please don't. Queenie, you've got nothing to fear if he wants to get married. We can just lift the enchantment and he can tell us himself. What well, you got there? What you gonna do? What you can do with that, Mrs. Commander? Sergeant. <laughs> Congratulations on your engagement, Jacob. Wait, what? Oh no, you didn't. I could also talk about the Imperious Curse, but at least that's illegal and punishable by law, whereas slipping someone a drug that makes them desperate to fuck you, or literally forcing someone to marry you, is not. It's like that girl in Misfits. so hard for you. I want to rip your clothes off and press on your teeth. No! What is happening to me? It's pretty fucked up, but no one seems to ever acknowledge it, which is extremely concerning to me. <laughs> My first indication that J.K. Rowling might not be totally free of any preconceived notions about gender roles and stereotypes was when I read the following passage. I wonder if Hermione's seen this yet, Harry said, looking around the door to the girls' dormitories. Let's go and tell her. 
said Ron. He bounded forward, pulling open the door and set off up the spiral staircase. He was on the sixth stair when it happened. There was a loud, wailing, klaxon-like sound, and the steps melted together to make a long, smooth stone slide. There was a brief moment when Ron tried to keep running, arms working madly like windmills, then he topped over backward and shot down the newly created slide, coming to rest on his back at Harry's feet. Uh, I don't think we're allowed in the girls' dormitories, said Harry. I didn't realise that was happening. That's not fair. Hermione's allowed in our dormitory. How come we're not allowed? Well, it's an old-fashioned rule, said Hermione, who just slid neatly onto a rug in front of them was now getting to her feet, but it says in Hogwarts history that the founders thought boys were less trustworthy than girls, which is never brought up or questioned again, beyond simply being called old-fashioned. No character thinks to question the rules or update or amend them, and let's be honest here, the kids range from 11 to 17 and have no biology or sex ed classes, so there is a definite non-zero amount of kids getting it on all over the place, especially considering how big and how many empty rooms and spaces there are in Hogwarts. I genuinely wonder what the room of requirement would look like to a horny couple, so it makes no sense. I'm sure someone like Dumbledore or McGonagall would see the issue with a system that assumes that men are always the aggressors and prevents sex happening in a safe space like a dormitory, but because sex is just something that JK Rowling thinks isn't a thing that a bunch of hormonal teenagers would ever think about, it's just never acknowledged other than that one amusing easter egg in the credits of the Prisoner of Azkaban movie. We do need to talk about the sex ed thing though. I'm sure they have foolproof magical contraception, but they have to learn about that somewhere, and I have no idea what the magical community's consensus is on abortion, but the fact of the matter is that sex ed is important for preventing teen pregnancy, which of course is highest in areas with no sex ed or absence-only sex ed in the muggle world, and ditto for STDs. The Weasleys, of course, have a truly enormous family, whether that be due to religious aversion to contraception, lack of comprehensive sex ed, or just wanting a ton of extra mouths to feed with money they don't have, we just don't know, but it's certainly interesting to speculate. Hey, did you know that JK Rowling is probably a turf? Well, I've mentioned it a couple of times now, but uh, I didn't either, actually, until I started noticing her Twitter activity, and then again when I started doing research in preparation for working on this video. Before we get into her online behaviour, however, I want to just highlight this actual real snippet from one of her novels under the pseudonym of Robert Galbraith. If you go for that door one more fucking time, I'm calling the police, and I'll testify and I'll be glad to watch you go down for attempted murder. And it won't be fun for you inside, Pippa, he added, not pre-up. Yikes. Let's talk about Twitter for a moment, shall we? Now, I have heard the argument that likes are not endorsements and follows are not endorsements, but I'm not necessarily sure I agree with that. However, as a result, I'm not saying that JK Rowling is definitely a turf. However, I would say that these examples are rather incriminating. She liked this post from a fellow transphobe who in the past described trans women as men in dresses. This article implying that trans women are just rapists pretending to be women in order to gain access to women's spaces. Happily slapped a like on anti-trans articles and attacks my journal list again, arguing that trans women are just dangerous men out to rape women, saying no fox has the right to live in a hen house even if he identifies as a hen, conveniently leaving out the extremely well documented fact that trans women are significantly more likely to be the victims of sexual or violent assault than being the perpetrator of one, and accused a trans model of being a porn model based on essentially nothing, and has now started following Magdalene Burns, a transphobe so vile that the depths of her bigotry are actually impressive. She has, for example, in the past stated that trans women's friends who accept them as a woman are just being polite that no trans women can ever pass, and that being trans is a delusional fantasy, and she's not the only one. Among Rowling's follow list is Graham Linehan and a number of other transphobes. She only follows 700 people, so it's not unrealistic to believe that this is not accidental. Rowling has denied all this of course, but do we believe her? That's the question, isn't it? I personally absolutely don't, but your mileage may vary. So what does this have to do with the text at hand? Well, it's interesting because Rowling has created ways for trans people to effectively not only transition from one gender to another, but effectively transform into whichever sex they prefer, through the use of Polyjuice Potion, which literally completely transforms you into anyone you like, including someone of a different sex or gender. Plus, it's really not out of the realms of possibility that this can be done on a permanent basis with magic. Ron has his features fucked around within the Deathly Hallows, so is it that much of a stretch to make the case that maybe this could be done with genitals or secondary sex characteristics as well? There are definitely spells which cause rapid beard growth after all, which would be extremely helpful to trans men. Weird that we don't see many of these trans witches and wizards, but I can't decide if it's due to Rowling's vicious transphobia, a lazy erasure of minority groups, or convenience. Or simply just another example of not wanting to reduce her audience of bigots. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,
just a brief point because I don't want to go off on a huge tangent about this and I'm not going to say that Harry Potter's anti-feminist or fully submit the entire series to an analysis under feminist theory which does sound interesting but I'm sure has been done before and you can find it online if you really want and obviously there are a lot of great female characters throughout the series but am I the only one who finds it a little odd that whilst there are a lot of women in senior roles there are no female leaders. Dumbledore, Voldemort, Harry, most of the Order of the Phoenix, both ministers for magic and a majority of authority figures in the ministry or elsewhere that we meet in the course of the books are men and the major female authority figures we meet other than the teachers at Hogwarts. The main one is a stay at home mum and housewife. Yes there are other senior figures but they're not leaders and it's just rather interesting to think about really. And yes I know that Hermione becomes minister and the cursed child but I don't consider that canon for the sake of my own sanity because if I did I would have to think about Voldemort's throbbing glistening veiny cock. I'm sorry for making you think about it as well. I'm not sure if this is some kind of unconscious bias on Rowling's part towards assuming that a majority of authority figures should be male based on patriarchal western standards and expectations, pure coincidence or an implication that much like our world the wizarding world is in some way institutionally and or socially sexist or biased against women but either way it's a little concerning. Maybe not worth a 10 minute rant or anything but definitely merits at least an acknowledgement in my opinion. <laughs> Everyone just goes off and has a bunch of kids after the books end, yeah? Kind of weird, right? I mean, you'd have thought that at least a couple of characters would have just been happy settling down with a partner and a couple of pets or something, right? I mean, look at Mrs. Fig. She seems happy. Rowling has a thing about kids. She said repeatedly that having kids was the best thing she ever did, that raising her daughter was so rewarding that she would go so far as to call it her greatest achievement, that motherhood makes her unbelievably happy, and that as a result, she wanted all her favourite characters to be happy too. So that therefore meant giving them all a bunch of kids. But there's a problem with that now isn't there? See, in the same way that Rowling didn't want to be accused of pushing a gay agenda by openly admitting in the text that Dumbledore was gay, she's actually pushing a different, more sinister agenda here. She is heavily implying, and imprinting upon a generation of young minds, this idea that children equals happiness, no matter the situation, and that's pretty toxic, at least in my view. You should find your own reasons for living. Search out your own happiness, don't place it on someone else, and especially not a child, because that is a surefire way to fuck up not only your own mental health, but potentially also so the child for life. Kids will not bring you happiness. As I told Paul Joseph Watson in a previous video, happiness has to come from within and to imply that the happiest people are those who had a ton of kids they weren't able to raise, which considering the economic climate nowadays, and especially the economic climate in the wizarding world, is most people, rather than those who are able to find it within themselves is, well it's pretty fucked up if you ask me. And studies have shown that having a kid to improve your relationship will do nothing but ruin it. Throughout these books we see various political groups, activists and depending on your perspective terrorists, but the ideology of each is never really thoroughly explored in any real depth, beyond trite villain speeches like this. There is no good and evil. There is only power, and those too weak to seek it. Together we'll do extraordinary things. Stone. And that, in my opinion, is a huge shame because, for the most part, the universe these books are set in is pretty well fleshed out. It just seems a little shallow when the main villain's motivation is be evil, do bad things, gain power and live forever, and his followers don't really seem to have any kind of motivation for joining him. Very weird. We arguably get more of an idea of what Grindelwald wants, though judging by the end of the Crimes of Grindelwald movie, his evil plan seems to be stopping the Holocaust. is what we are fighting.
Okay then, I guess. It's clear that the Death Eaters are intended to be wizard fascists, though sadly there is very little actual discussion or detail given of the specifics of their ideology beyond wizard supremacy, blood purity, and just generic shit about power, which is disappointing because I'm a fucking loser who loves talking about that kind of shit. I actually read the entirety of both Labour and Conservative manifestos on the day they came out. I'm recording this bit before the Conservative manifesto came out, so I'm intending to do so. If the Conservative manifesto isn't out by the time this video's come out, we're in fucking trouble, but all also, assume that I will. And I've booked the 13th of December off work so I can stay up all night on the 12th and watch the election results live. Interestingly, positioning Voldemort and the Death Eaters as wizard fascists then makes the Order of the Phoenix wizard Antifa. It would be a clever reference if it were in any way, shape or form intentional, but knowing what we know about Rowling's own political and philosophical beliefs, I highly doubt that she intended for several of her favourite characters to be part of a radical political movement focused on stopping the rise of fascism through a policy of direct action, and if it's anything like real Antifa, they probably mostly be pretty far left in their political beliefs as well, and Rowling has decided that accepting the existence of trans people is too far left for her, so maybe it would be a little too much to expect her to be cool enough to deliberately be referencing an overwhelmingly far left group like Antifa. When it comes to Grindelwald, it's a little more complicated. He seems to want wizard supremacy and the subjugation of the Muggles due to his visions of the future, in which he has seen that the Muggles are destructive and evil, which is an interesting take on the idea, though it is kind of contradicted by the books, and of course we can't have nuance in our villains can we? So Rowling made sure to just make him Wizard Hitler, who kills a baby for no reason in case you thought he might have been the good guy in all this. Once again though, we don't get any real discussion of the motivations and inspirations behind the ideology, just empty statements like these. It is said that I hate the Nomagic, the Muggle, the Nomad, the Count Spell. I do not hate them. I do not, for I do not fight out of hatred. I say the muggles are not lesser, but other. Not worthless, but of other value. Not disposable, but of a different disposition. Magic blooms only in rare souls. It is granted to those who do for higher things. Oh, and what a world we would make for all of humanity, we who live for freedom, for truth, and for love. Their arrogance their power lust, their barbarity. How long will it take before they turn their weapons on us? See, Grindelwald is right that the Muggles are about to cause severe, horrendous pain and anguish to one another, and maybe if the wizards had an ounce of compassion, they would do something about it. Though, of course, Grindelwald believes that the best way to do that is to take over and subjugate the Muggles, which is, you know, a bit much. But he does identify a problem, even if his solution is a little drastic. I'm hoping, possibly against hope, because fuck subtlety, am I right, that in one of these movies we will actually explore his ideology in some depth beyond just wanting to take control of the Muggles for basically no reason beyond wizard supremacy. I really hope we get some kind of in-depth discussion of it. I really want that. Please, J.K. Rowling, I know you're a bad writer now. I know that you made a movie in which four or five characters literally just stand in a circle and explain the plot to one another for ten minutes, but please, for me, please do this. Seven in the morning and I'm lying in my bed A million ways to hurt you running round and round my head I won't feel guilty for that I won't feel guilty for that, no, no, no You know all those conspiracies about how Big Pharma secretly invented cures for cancer, Alzheimer's, etc, and are just hiding it from the world so they can make more money from cancer treatments than they ever would with cancer cures? Well, in the magical world, that's 
basically true, though the reasoning is much more ideological than profit driven. Allow me to finish up this video by explaining what I mean. See, the wizards have magical cures for basically every mortal disease and presumably regularly use them on themselves. Throughout the books we see spells that unblock someone's throat, fix broken bones, heal cuts, etc, and potions that regrow bones, heal burns, something called a calming draught, which is basically just a cure from anxiety, and a cure for the common cold. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. As JK Rowling herself said, I pondered the issue of illness and disability very early in the creation of Harry's world. Did wizards catch colds? Could they cure illnesses that baffled muggles? Were there disabled wizards? What were the limits of wizarding medicine, or could it fix anything? Some of these questions went to the heart of the story because the theme of death runs throughout every volume of the Harry Potter books. Having decided that magic could not raise the dead, even the resurrection stone does not truly return the death to life, I then had to decide what might kill a wizard, what kind of illnesses they could catch, what injuries they might sustain, and which of the last two could be cured. I decided that, broadly speaking, wizards would have the power to correct or override mundane nature, but not magical nature. Therefore, a wizard could catch anything a muggle might catch, but he could cure all of it. He would also conceivably survive a scorpion sting that might kill a muggle, whereas he might die if bitten by a venomous tentacular. Similarly, bones broken in non-magical accidents such as falls or fistfights can be mended by magic, but the consequences of curses or backfiring magic could be serious, permanent or life-threatening. This is the reason that Gilderoy Lockhart, the victim of his own mangled memory charm, has permanent amnesia, why the poor Longbottoms remain permanently damaged by magical torture, and why Mad-Eye Moody had to resort to a wooden leg and a magical eye when the originals were irreparably damaged in a wizard's battle. Luna Lovegood's mother, Pandora, died when one of her own experimental spells went wrong and Bill Weasley is irreversibly scarred after his meeting with Fenrir Greyback. The statute of secrecy actively causes the entirely preventable deaths of billions of people every single year. This can't be overstated. Every muggle death due to injury, starvation or disease is by the hands of the wizards and their unwillingness to integrate based on shit that happened centuries ago from the black plague to malaria to cancer to heart failure to fucking anything is not only childish but actively evil. Remember the US government's disgusting and pitiful response to the AIDS crisis in the 80s? Imagine that, but with every disease in the world and for hundreds or thousands of years. But this is of course reflective of the political philosophy of the wizarding world and by implication Rowling herself because there is no way to really justify this without an ideology that specifically revolves around, or at the very least highly prioritises, a Randian ideal of individualism, or to give it its proper name, selfishness. To the point where, just like the protagonist in Atlas Shrugged, it is preferable to literally murder billions than be compelled to save lives. It is honestly horrifying when you think about it. I mean, every friend, family member and loved one anyone has ever lost due to the limitations or failures of the human body is dead because Hermione Granger, the great abolitionist and civil rights advocate in her youth in the 90s, who I think is the Minister for Magic around now, let them die. And this isn't even brought up or debated in the books. Muggles are just seen as inferior most of the time. The idea is that they'll just ask us to do their shit for them with magic. But like, there's a lot of leeway between people wanting you to magically do their dishes and allowing billions of innocent people to die by an action. You know, maybe there's some kind of compromise there, but nope, the genetically superior magical master race must protect their individual rights and choices too. In this case, literally murder my beloved, wonderful grandmother for no other reason than that she might have also asked for some help with the laundry. And look, I'm I'm not going to sit here and say that it's impossible that the ministry in the books is just a particularly far right or conservative one and could be voted out or replaced by a left wing muggle rights party, but well, as we've just established, that's almost certainly not the case and even if it was, this attitude is mainstream, to the point where someone like Arthur Weasley, not even a radical muggle advocate, just a hobbyist who takes an interest in muggle technology, is seen as a kook by the rest of the wizarding community, and Hagrid, who for the first couple of books and for most of his life is just like a groundskeeper at a school, is the first one who comes up with this idea that the muggles would just want us to do all their shit for them. So that's probably not the case. Besides, we never see any major pushback against the treatment of muggles, and all the way until Book 7 where Hermione points out the statue that Voldemort erects in the Ministry of a witch and wizard standing atop a pile of muggle corpses with a fascist motto engraved into it, that's the point where maybe we should start feeling sorry and or really anything for the muggles outside of just like token references to people like Hermione's parents, and nothing even slightly less serious. There are no protests, no votes, no rumblings of a growing opposition party, nothing to indicate that there might even be the tiniest resistance within the wizarding community. Where are Wizard Antifa? Assuming of course that the Order of the Phoenix is not Wizarding Antifa of course. What well, you see in Rowling's mind, Wizard Antifa are the real Death Eaters. I think this is fascinating because this is the exact sort of rhetoric that leads to the rise of the far right. In the run up to 2016 and even shortly thereafter, people were minimising the threat white supremacists and white nationalists posed to Western democracy, to the point where Milo Yiannopoulos could appear on Bill Nye's show 
Richard Spencer was given airtime by the mainstream media and during the election Donald Trump received an overwhelming majority of the news coverage despite, or more likely because of, the outrageous racist white supremacist rhetoric he was using all the time. It's the consistent demonization of refugees, Muslims and migrants that have led to the support Trump gets over the wall, the border camps and the Muslim ban, and I dread to think what's coming next if he wins in 2020, and the media helped to spread this disinformation. Likewise, in 20th century Europe, there was a lot of widespread anti-Semitism, but no one took Hitler seriously until they realised what he was doing, because a lot of the rhetoric he was using wasn't all that dissimilar to what they believed. The difference wasn't the attitude towards the Jews, but the decision to act on that hatred that caused such a disconnect. Oh, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Think about all the magic we see in Harry Potter. How much of it could be used to improve the lives of people across the globe? Transfiguration could help to end world hunger, as we mentioned earlier. The spell around Hogwarts that stops technology working could disarm nuclear weapons. And fucking time travel and instantaneous teleportation? Those things would revolutionise our world. How many people who die in ambulances on the way to the hospital could be saved if they were apparated directly to A&E? What if surgeons could redo botched surgeries, utilising the time turner to save lives? Honestly, I could go on about this for hours, and actually I have, but this video is already too long, so I'll just leave it at that for now. Harry Potter is dead. From this day forth, you put your faith in me. Wow, that was actually quite a long video, wasn't it? I honestly didn't expect it to end up going on quite as long as it did, but it turns out that both politics and Harry Potter are both pretty complex and take a long time to talk about in any amount of depth, as I found when I decided to make a couple of videos about the UK election and ended up making a four hour long epic, which basically boils down to vote Labour if you're not a dickhead. Again, that may or may not be out yet, but if it's not, look forward to that. I mostly made this to give myself an excuse to discuss these serious issues through the lens of a popular media product and potentially bring these ideas to a wider wider audience that may not otherwise be interested, but also because I think it's important to be aware of the political messaging in our media. As that old saying goes, everything is political, but especially arts, and I think that's definitely true. I still love Harry Potter, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that it's certainly not perfect, and some of its politics are confused at best and malicious at worst. Actually, that's a great description of Rowling herself, now I think about it. I'm a wizard bitch, you can't defeat me Cause I'm a predator too, like Danny Glover on a GT And when I rap son, I cast spells And when I'm banging your wench, I make it rain like hells Yes I did, and I'll do it again I'm from the city of wind, we keep our winches on bend You can lock me up but I'll break out Whistle for my dragon with the diamond saddle caked out And then we hit the club And then we tip the potion Ayo hey, bitch, break out the lotion And now lather up And lather down Grab a hold of my staff And go to town 